You're listening to the Potaholics Comedy Network. Potaholics.com. Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. I'm Mike Coletta. And my name is Tyler Osby. And today we are discussing legal cases that are important to video games. And very exciting, I promise. And very exciting and interesting from chapter 21 titled The Legal Game in the Ultimate History of Video Games by Stephen L. Kent. Tyler, you got our first case? Yes, Take I it away. do. Uh, so we're going to cover the cases that are covered in the book, um, which you should definitely check out. It's like five bucks on Amazon. Uh, we also have um, one or two extra cases in the end, too, that I think are important. So that I want to talk about. That we added in. Right. Because we're special and we know stuff about video Independent games. research. That's right. Uh, so the first case we're going to talk about here is between two companies that uh, probably people haven't heard of, but they're very important anyway. Data East versus Epix. And Epix is with a Y. Right. This is not the Epic Games of today, the e of Fortnite and Unreal Tournament fame. That's right. This is EPYX. Yes. Totally different company. Uh, so in 1984, Data East made a game called Karate Champ for the arcades. Which we talked about last episode. Yeah. It wasn't the first fighting game, but it did kind of popularize the genre a little bit, Get it, got it kick-started in the arcades. Um, so th this is a genre that would really peak in the early 90s with stuff like Street Fighter and Tekken and Mortal Kombat and all that stuff. Um, this game came out the same year that the Karate Kid came out. Mm, coincidence? Who knows? Cobra Kai forever. That's right. So in October 1985, they released Karate Champ on the Commodore 64. Not a month later, another game called International Karate was released by a company called System 3. This is a European company. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so Epix licensed International Karate and released it on the Commodore 64 in the US, and they called it World Karate. So we have we really have two karate games here. We have Karate Champ. This is in the US. We have the Karate Champ, and we have World Karate Championship. And Data East was not too happy about this. So they sued Epic, saying that the overall appearance uh, compilation and sequence of audio video display of the video game World Karate Championship infringed upon Karate Champ. Basically, they're like, You ripped us off. What the heck, dude? Producer Toby is really <laughs> knocking all over, over us. the microphones. <laughs> We're leaving this in. People have to know about the cat. Yeah, the cat is really all up in our business right now. It's all good. I'll pick him up and take him off the table. <laughs> um, so, when you look at these two games, they're pretty similar. Uh, they've got the same number of moves. Almost all of the moves were the same, and a lot of the animations were even the same. Like some of the uppercut things, like oh, they left a foot on the ground. It, like it was. If you go back and look at like a comparison between, oh my goodness, Toby, <laughs> he just keeps knocking. I'm, we're gonna out. have to oh, if we lock him out. He'll meow. Yeah, it's okay. We'll just keep going. All right. So anyway, these games were super similar, and it was pretty obvious if you look at both of them. They're they're pretty similar. Um, but the interesting thing was, at this point in time, um, it wasn't really solidified, but uh, like what a company could own as part of a video game, and like what they didn't necessarily own. So this is an important case for uh, talking about how you can like sue another company for ripping your game off. Basically, like what kind of stuff can you rip off, and what kind of stuff can't. Which you? is interesting because now with PUBG suing all these other small companies making fake PUBG games essentially right. applies to this case. Right. And so it's like, well, do they own a copyright on the game mode of Battle Royale? That's pretty nebulous, but if it's in the if it's obvious that they're being uh, if they like art assets are being ripped off and stuff like that, it gets a much more difficult. Toby is the he's best. He's rubbing my beard right now. He, he's really going for it. <laughs> he's like, "Oh, you guys are busy? Let me jump in here." <laughs> so the court recognized that uh, even though they were both about karate t tournaments, so it's natural that a lot of things would be similar, right? Um, the they didn't they, they they were really too similar to be considered separate. Like they were, it was pretty egregious here, according to the first court. So Data East won this case at first, but then it was overturned when Epics appealed to the higher court. In the higher court, it was determined that karate games are going to be similar, sure, um, but there's just no proof that Epics like had any access to Data East source code. There's no real proof that they actually ripped it off. They ruled that just because the game has similar rules, it isn't really enough to say that these games are the same. And um, the the real things that are copyrightable in a game are the things like the art assets, like the scoreboard and the background scenes. And those things were definitely different between the games. Like they definitely used pretty much different art assets. And that's huge too, because again, that would mean like 
the first first person shooter could be like, uh, you stole our idea, and then first person shooters are entirely one company. Right, exactly. So Which there's is a crazy. difference. <laughs> yeah, there's a difference between uh, being inspired by a genre or, or making another game in a genre and completely ripping off. Game, Essentially, right? to save the variety of games. Right. Yeah. Look so it's did. actually really important that uh, that. Data East eventually ends up losing this. Um, Because this would be a a pretty influential case, especially in 1993, when Capcom would release Street Fighter 2 and Data East again. Um, They would release a game called Fighter's History, and Capcom sued Data East, and Data East was like, look, we've been here before. Um, You're you're not going to win this, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to win this, and Capcom did not win. Uh, So that's that's one of the first uh, really important cases uh, in terms of the copyright of video games. Um, the next case I want to talk about is one of Atari versus Nintendo. So after taking over Atari uh, Atari games, this is when Atari was split into two. Remember, we have Atari, the corporation that makes the coin-op stuff. And mm-hmm. we have Atari games, which makes the console stuff. And these, and one of them is owned by the Tremiel family now. Right. That's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so after taking over Atari games, uh, the non-coin-op division, uh, Hideyuki Nakajima... Um, really wanted to start using Atari's arcade games in home consoles. He really wanted to start putting some of the, the games that they had the rights to on basically on the NES. Um, so for, for some legal, other legal reasons, like they had the rights to the games, but they didn't actually have the right to uh, the Atari brand, I think, um, which belonged to the, the coin-op division. So they had all these games, these Atari games, that they couldn't put an Atari label on. Um, so what, they, what he started doing was he wanted to sell these games under a, a brand called Tengen. Um, and... So if you're a, a, a NES video game collector, you know about Tengen games. They look a little bit different, and we're going to get into why that is. So Nakajima wanted to sell these games on the NES uh, since it was the most viable system at the time. What he didn't want to do was play by Nintendo's rules because they held kind of an iron grip on uh, who was licenses, licensees and who could make games for the NES. Um, so he didn't want to play by those rules, and Arakawa the guy who's running uh, Nintendo, he was forcing all these rules on partners equally. So he wasn't giving anybody special privileges at this point. Nakajima signed the deal anyway, and his engineers got to work on breaking the copy protection inside the NES, Whoa. breaking the license protection, that 10 nest thing that we've talked about, the lockout chip. Um, so they ended up releasing a few games, Pac-Man, RBI Baseball, and Gauntlet. They did this, you know, totally cool under the licensing uh, they, they did everything that they were supposed to, because mostly because they weren't able to decipher the code that made the 10 nest work, so they just weren't able to hack it. But what they did was one of their lawyers got a hold of the code from the copyright office, because Nintendo had the 10 nest chip copyrighted. They uh, claimed to the copyright office, they were like, hey, Nintendo is suing us, so we need to be able to see this code so that we can claim that we didn't infringe upon it, right? Nintendo was not suing them. And that would come back to bite them a little bit because oh, they yeah. got this code and they shouldn't have. They got it under false pretenses. But anyway, they got the code and that allowed them to develop what they called the rabbit chip, which was their own version of the 10 nest chip that got around Nintendo's lockout system. Um, so now they didn't have to play by Nintendo's rules because they could make their own cartridges with their own copy protection scheme and uh, they could do it for cheaper and basically get around paying Nintendo royalties. So at this point, now that they've got their their chip on lockdown, they know they don't need Nintendo, they sue Nintendo. Whoa. You would think it'd be the other way around. Like, they yeah. just released these games, and Nintendo would be like, oh, you can't do that. Atari was like, no, we're going to get a jump on this. They wanted. They were claiming that Nintendo had an illegal monopoly on NES games. Um, it didn't really matter how much merit that claim had. The reason they filed that suit was because it made it impossible for Nintendo to file an injunction that would keep Tengen from selling their illicit games on the market. So if they didn't sue Nintendo, Nintendo would have definitely sued them. And what they would have, what Nintendo would have done is gone to the judge and said, hey, while we're suing them, you need to tell them to stop selling these games, right? But because Atari sued first, Nintendo would not be able to ask a judge to tell them to stop selling their games while the, while the, the court case... Uh, played out so uh, some pretty good pretty good game of thrones in going on there atari yeah. getting ahead of the game so they knew they knew they were going to get tied up in legal issues it's a so, total lannister move yeah it's a total lannister move they knew they were going to get tied up in those legal issues and they knew that they needed to keep from keep nintendo from filing an injunction on them um so there's a uh like sort of a relationship question here of like why would nakajima of tengen games be so aggro with nintendo 
No, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, the book cites a rumor, though, that back in the day, when Namco was signed as the first licensee for Nintendo, they got some special treatment. Um, and Nakajima was part of Namco back in the day, so he was kind of around for this special treatment. Um, when Namco came time to review their contract with, with Nintendo, uh, their favorable, like, awesome contract that they really liked, Nintendo was like, mm, no, we're not doing these favorable terms this time. you got to play by the rules like everybody else. And so it made Namco pretty mad, which made Nakajima pretty mad. Uh, he was not cool with Nintendo doing this, uh, so the rumor is that he was bitter and wanted revenge. We don't know if that's true. Kind of makes for a good story, though. If you were making a movie version of this case, you would definitely put that in as oh, like yeah. Nakajima getting his revenge on Nintendo. <laughs> um, but this continues here. Nintendo was playing the long con. They waited 11 months before taking any action at all, and then they dropped all the bombs. They countersued, claiming Atari had infringed upon patents, breached their contract. They sent letters to retailers saying that there would be legal consequences for any retail that was carrying Tengen games. They were like, if you sell Tengen games, we are going to stop allowing you to sell Nintendo games. And so every single uh, store was like, okay, cool. We're not going to sell these Tengen games. They're not selling that great anyway. We don't want to be, we don't want to get like messed up by Nintendo, right? Um, so Tengen had a rough time, which was rough for them. Yeah. At this point in time, copyright laws claimed that while computer programs could be copyrighted, the data that they produced could not be copyrighted. Um, the way that, uh, Tengen had got around the Ten Nest system was basically by uh, seeing the seeing the response that the the legitimate uh, Ten Nest chip would give to the NES. Um, it was like, oh, this is what it sends back to the NES. We'll make a chip that also sends that back to the NES, pretty much. Um, so they like while Nintendo was able to copyright the code inside the Ten Nest chip that produced that message. Um, Tengen was able to make a chip that also did the same thing, and that's not breaching any copyrights. So basically, it's okay to reverse engineer copy protection as long as you don't illegally use copyrighted material. Problem is, Atari did use illegally obtained copyrighted material to figure out what they needed to do to make a chip that did the same thing as the Tenness. So Atari didn't dispute that Nintendo owned the code for Tenness. So the question was, was their rabbit chip a direct copy of Tenness or not? If it was not, did Atari need the illegally obtained specs from the copyright office in order to get around it? Uh, Nintendo, in court, showed that there were, in fact, other ways to get around the 10 NES system and that Atari could have done it any number of ways that didn't require them to get this data that they got from the copyright office. So Atari lost that battle. Ninten yes. Nintendo, like, they had to stop selling their games. Uh, and when I say Atari in this whole case, Atari and Tengen are... The same. The same, yeah. We're going to get into it more later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Atari lost that battle, but the war would wage on. That's right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Tetris. Yes. Were you good at Tetris? Yes. I had Tetris World... Well, yeah, I mean, good at Tetris is a relative term. I thought I was pretty good. I had Tetris Worlds for Game Boy Advance, it's and I game. played so much of that game. My mom played a lot of Tetris, too. Uh, she really liked Tetris. I remember getting her at one point, like, one of those little, like, keychain game things for Tetris, oh, that's and cool. she played it all the time. She... The You're only game... son. Yeah, the only game I've ever seen my mom like play a lot of like a console game that I would like come home and she would be playing on my Super <laughs> Nintendo was Tetris Attack. Oh, which was like uh, I, I don't know if people have played Tetris Attack. It's like a puzzle like match three sort of puzzle switching game. If you've played Pokemon Puzzle League, it's a, that's that game. Oh, um, yeah, this was a game that like my mom doesn't play video games except for like Tetris Attack. Tetris Attack, right? So I would come home and she would be playing Tetris Attack on my Super Nintendo, and I thought that was awesome. That is but, that is really awesome. But anyway, there's lots of legal issues with Tetris back in the day. So it was. So it was created by Soviet mathematician Alexei Pajitnov while working at the Computer Center of the Moscow Academy of Science. Keep in mind, this is Soviet Union. We're very much in the Soviet Union right in now. In Soviet Russia, I can't play so you. It's right, exactly. <laughs> He created it on a Russian clone of a PDP that's a programmable data processor, which is the same type of computer that Stephen Russell created Space War on, the only difference being Stephen Russell's was a PDP-1, while Pajitnov's, because it was a clone and not legitimately the brand, was mm -hmm. something around the specs of a PVP-11. Okay. So pretty much the whole legal battle starts with a fight over who owns the rights to Tetris, and I will now... List them in order, and it's going to get very confusing. <laughs> Bear with me again. I am so sorry. Here we go. Going to go real slow. First, it was bought 
from the Moscow Academy of Science by Robert Stein. It was bought from them because, again, Alexei didn't own anything because mm-hmm. in Soviet Russia, it's owned by the state. Right. Or the people, if you're trying to spin it the right way. No, says the man in Moscow. <laughs> yeah. It belongs to everyone. And Robert Stein was the president of the London-based PC game company Andromeda. So they own the rights. At this point, they own At the rights. At this point. Then, Stein sells the European rights to a company called Mirrorsoft and the American rights to a company called Spectrum Holobyte. So we've split off now. There's a European country that owns the rights, and there is a there's yeah, the, the Europe, American company. The European company. rights and the American rights. Okay. Two different companies. Right. European Mirrorsoft, American Spectrum Holobyte. It splits again when Spectrum Holobyte then sells the Japanese rights of Tetris to an entrepreneur named Hank Rogers. How does Spectrum have the Japanese rights? Does, is, shouldn't that still be Andromeda? Okay, sorry. All right, yeah, I'll, let you no. go. I'll let you keep going. I'm right. glad you, you should be a lawyer because you're <laughs> finding it out right away. Uh, at the same time that happens, Mirrorsoft then sells the Japanese rights of Tetris to Atari. Oh, geez. And that dispute was settled actually pretty quick between Hank Rogers and Atari, and Atari won. Now, okay. Yeah, I don't know how they won, but they agreed to like sign the Japanese console and PC rights to Rogers. I think it was a settlement. And okay. then the arcade rights went to Sega. So now we've split again. So now there's like six different companies that own various rights to, yes. set, to Tetris. And then Hank Rogers had an idea. No one owned the handheld rights to Tetris, and Rogers knew that the, the Game Boy was coming out soon. Mm. And he was like, oh, this will, this will be really good. This will be perfect for a Game Boy launch title. And so he then went to the Soviets in Moscow and was like, hey, I'd like the handheld rights to Tetris. You never sold these. And then like Soviets are like, why don't we just sell you the worldwide rights to Tetris? And Rogers is like, wait, what? What about all the rights? Okay. <laughs> and then <laughs> he feels nervous about it. So... Because he knew that Mirrorsoft and Atari had those rights at this point, but the deal was so tempting that he decided to bring Nintendo in and be like, this seems sketchy, I need the backing of a big company, but this is a great game and it's too much to pass up. So on May, oh no, excuse me, March 22nd, 1988, a mere 20 days before the birth of the very host of this podcast, me, Mike Coletta, <laughs> Nintendo <laughs> purchased the rights to Tetris and began to make a game for the NES as well as the Game Boy. Wow. Which was bad news for Atari because they were working on an NES version of Tetris as well. The was same, that going to be a Tengen? Yeah, it would be Tengen. It would be under Tengen at the time. Yeah. And then when they found out from a fax from Nintendo that Nintendo had purchased the rights, two weeks later, Atari just immediately filed a copyright claim. Like, we're going to get ahead of this. Again, like the last case. Yeah. So the Tengen version of Tetris was released in May of 1989, and the Nintendo version came out a month later. These are both for the NES. Reviewers and the general public agreed that the Tengen version was better. It was actually created by Ed Logg, the man who made Asteroids and Centipedes. So it was a good port of the arcade game and had one player and two player split screen. So overall a better game. The NES was just single player. Oh, yeah. So the Tengen version was way better. But then a lawsuit over the ownership was overseen by the same judge as the 10 NES lawsuit you just talked about. Oh, it was the same judge between Tengen and Atari the last time Atari sued yeah. Nintendo. Oh, and geez. so the judge was d- didn't even go to trial. The judge was just like, I'm siding with Nintendo again. This is like the exact same case. He's like, this is ridiculous. You guys need to stop suing each other. Yeah, so as a result of that, the game was locked up, pulled from sh- shelves, and never sold again. In fact, there's a quote in the book about a cage in the back of an office of Tengen that was just full of NES Tetris games. That they couldn't sell. They couldn't sell. But because of this, it spiked in the market. It was a better game. So this cartridge went for $300 if you owned it. Whoa, I feel like I've seen it at places before. If you own a 10-gen version of the NES Tetris, people would pay you $300 for it at the time. Oh, man. It was a I high always wondered, commodity. Because I had definitely seen it at like retro collector stores, and I just didn't know what I yeah. guess it was. But like I've definitely seen that and like the Nintendo Tetris side-by-side side and often wondered, like, how could there be two? These are very clearly like made by different company games. Like, how does this happen? Is there is there some? I guess I always thought that there was some like public domain, like Tetris. Something had happened, and Tetris became public domain or something. And I was just like, I guess anybody can make a Tetris game, but it's not true. It's not true. The Soviets just double dipped on big, their licensing. Big fight over it. They yeah. they played both sides. Wow. There is a happy note to this story, I should say. Pajitnov, the man who actually made the game. And he got no royalties during all of this because it was not owned by him. It was owned by the USSR. Mm-hmm. 
So, but because everyone knew he designed it and how talented he was, is making he was an important person. He immigrated to the U.S. and with the help of Hank Rogers, nice guy Hank Rogers, mm-hmm. he started the Tetris Company LLC. And after that moment, after he established that company. All of the royalties to any Tetris game then went to him. So he did make some money in the okay. end. So he eventually was like, look, none of y'all own this. It's I made now. this. Yeah. yeah. And it's now, and people are like, oh, without a doubt, you yeah. made this. It was just, I think also a lot of anti-communist sentiments at the time. So it's like, we want to side with capitalism, you know? And so he was able to get royalties for the game. Yeah. And there was, there was probably a bit of like, we don't know what the legal landscape here is if we wanted to make another Tetris game. So it's easier for all sides if we just all agree that this guy who definitely made it owns it, and then we can just, if we want to make Tetris games, we can license it from him. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So that's that case. Happy okay. ending. Yeah. Nintendo um, wins again. Atari, Tengen gets pretty much screwed over, yeah. and there's no nice way to say it. Yep. And then their games are locked up. Now we're going to move on to Sega Enterprises Limited versus Accolade Incorporated. And this is a case involving... Two former VCS programmers, Alan Miller and Bob Whitehead, and they created a company called Accolade, and they decided to port their own PC games to the Sega Genesis in 1989. This is the Genesis 1. Uh First problem arose when Accolade decided to not get a license from Sega. Uh, They don't want to play ball. We don't want to do the license thing. It costs too much money. I think... In the book, it mentions that it raises the price of games by fifteen dollars. Ooh! So it like costs them fifteen more dollars for each game. So they decided, you know what? What we're going to do to design games is we're going to make printouts of the code and create their own manual for designing Genesis games. They reverse engineered the Genesis and then created their own user manual on how to make games for it. Wow. They did that instead of getting a license. All right. Well, I guess that's one way to do it. Yeah, right? I mean, the first game designed by Accolade was a port of a PC strategy game called Ashido in 1990, and the program ran on the original Genesis no problem at all. Just ran flawlessly. The problem came in 1990 when Sega released the Genesis 3, and this had a security system in it where when a game was inserted, the Genesis 3 searches for the letters S-E-G-A. It was called the Trademark Security System, or TMSS. So it's looking for those three letters buried in the code of the game. The idea being that if you put these three, these four letters in your game, you are infringing upon Sega's copyright. Oh, if you don't have them, yeah. Right. If, if you, you or if you do have them, you have a you license. Don't, yeah. If you do have them, you have. If you do have them and you don't have a license, then you're infringing on copyright by having them in. There. Yeah, and, okay. and that, that comes into play later. If it finds the game, if, if in the game, if it finds those four letters, the game starts and is compatible, no problems. If not, it shows an invalid license message for the game, which is kind of bad for the customer, because if you buy a game that's not licensed, you plug it in, you just, it just won't work. Yeah. So. When and that's Gen- not the customer's fault. No, it's not the customer's fault at all. So when Sega Genesis 3 was demoed at the Winter Consumer Electronics Show in 1991, the demonstration of the security system was done with an Ishido cartridge by Accolade. It was demoed as being a non-licensed game, and it didn't work. I wonder how you play that off when you're demoing this at a CES show, because it's for consumers. I guess if you're demoing it for... For game manufacturers, this makes sense. But if you're demoing it for consumers and you're like, hey, this doesn't play some of your games. How great is that? Yeah, it's like it's a weird thing to do. Also, just sh- like shove it in Accolade's face. Like, yeah. hey, we know you don't have a license and we know you did something fishy to make it. So now we're letting the whole world know. We're putting yeah. you on blast. So on the first reverse engineer of the Genesis 3, this is Accolade trying to find out how it's done. They're trying to emulate the TMSS now. Lorenzen found the TMSS in a small, seemingly useless power-up code with no function at all. He found the letters S-E-G-A there. Mm-hmm. So once caught, they added their hack TMSS code to the game's Star Control, Hardball, Turrican, and Mike Ditka Power Football. And those games worked flawlessly. Mm-hmm. They, didn't, they made a mistake, though. On the fifth game they designed, Onslaught... They put the code in the wrong place, and so it didn't boot right. They just Did they made an error. they not test it before they... I don't know. That's, that's what... Yeah, it just didn't work right. I'm guessing it got caught in a, in the, like the company bureaucracy. I don't know. So Strange. it didn't... Yeah, it didn't work. So Onslaught didn't work, but those four other games did work. So they, they found out how to emulate they, the TMSS code. Because it's pretty easy to just be like, oh, this is how it works. Great. We're yeah. just going to put that in our thing, too. And because they found out how to do it, on October 31st, 1991, Halloween, 
Sega filed suit against Accolade for trademark infringement, unfair competition, and added copyright infringement to the list a month later. Dang. So they're going for it. Accolade responded with a counterclaim accusing Sega of false designation of origin and unfair competition. <sighs> Accolade said Sega injured their reputation by falsely attributing Accolade with unlicensed games at that Winter Consumer Electronics Show. So they're going back to that, like, you guys even made, like, an example of us at the Winter Consumer yeah. Electronics Show. Like, what you are you doing? You put us on blast. That was really mean. Yeah, it's not nice to do. The first judge in the case was Judge Robert F. Peckham, and he was thought to be sympathetic towards entrepreneurs, but then he had a heart attack early on in the case. Oh, so if, if he had been able to see this case to completion it might have been different it might have been different yeah so what ended up happening was he was filled and quickly replaced with judge barbara caulfield and she did not side with accolade at all (laughs) here's what sega wanted sega wanted accolade to not make any more games for sega ever again and they need to abandon any future attempts at reverse engineering sega consoles they want that in writing you guys did this wrong yeah and Accolade just wanted Sega to stop producing Genesis 3 consoles. Like, you guys are doing something really sketchy. We don't like it. You guys can't make... These consoles don't play our games. That's not cool. Yeah, it's not cool. All right. And this whole case, I should say, is about the idea of fair use. And fair use, I have a demonstration, uh, an example of the definition of fair use. Okay. From Barbara Caulfield. This is her definition. Granted, keep in mind, she'll end up siding with Sega. But this is her five reasons that she in in, this is from the case actually Uh, one the purpose and character of the use including whether such is a use of commercial nature or if it is for non-profit educational purposes the nature of the copyrighted work the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work so it's essentially saying this is what the criteria are to consider it to be fair use. And I don't know if her, because this, again, this is really like mucky. So, because we're about to see an example of another judge who doesn't agree with this yeah. at all. So, so, so the accolade's trying to say, hey, this is fair use. We can use your code. We can your use code. your code. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the judge, so the, the, basically what those, those reasons are like, are you trying to make money and are you keeping other people from making money by, yeah. by using this code? Right. Essentially, that's what she's saying. And so what ends up happening now is uh, she ruled that Accolade was not protected by fair use because they were profiting off of Sega's games and took money from Sega by being in direct competition. So by breaking that TMS code, SS code, they are pulling money away from Sega licensed games because they're flooding the market with their games. And she says it's not fair use for that reason. Yeah. I mean, it's an argument. Yeah. You know, so... She also cited with Sega on trademark infringement, since when you booted up an Accolade cartridge, it still said the licensed product screen. Oh, licensed by Sega? It's a big no-no. Yeah. Oh, so they were, it's not true. It's, it's a lie. You're right. And it's and the other thing that happened that really like made this look bad is Sega brought in their own engineer named Taki, Takeshi Nagashima to testify, and he showed how a non-licensed company could break the TMSS code Without showing the licensing oh, screen. Oh, that's Nintendo did the same thing in their case against Atari. Remember? Yeah. They're like, they're like, look, you didn't need to do it in this way that used the copyright code. You could have done it in any number of other ways. Yeah. Which is a really interesting way of, of like being like, like you could break it a lot this way. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's not fair use because you could have broken you could have broken in this way. Yeah. It's 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 really convoluted and I'm, we're going to get into why some of these things are disputed in the next version so accolade uh, was again for like atari forced to pull their inventory from the market and was not allowed to produce games for sega consoles or reverse engineer them Whoops. sega won but they appealed to the ninth circuit court of appeals on july 20th 1992 in front of a different judge named steven reinhardt and he interpreted fair use law way differently than judge barbara caulfield <laughs> he stated That there is no other way to know how a system works other than reverse engineering it. It's the only way to know. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the only way to find out, then it's fair use because there's no other way to do it. So he also dismissed the testimony of Sega engineer Takeshi Nagashima because he's like, well, of course you know how to do it. You designed the system. Yeah. But they're gonna ha- there's no way they would know how to break the TMSS code like that if they didn't reverse engineer in the first place. So your argument is invalid. Hmm. That so that's how he took it. Reinhardt also mentioned how the game included 
like a typical Sega game included 500,000 to 1 million 500,000 bytes of data and the TMS file was only 20 to 25 bytes of data and was therefore so minuscule it shouldn't matter to the rest of the yeah. game. And it's accurate because that code doesn't, like all it does is allow the game to start up. It, That's it, it. It's a boot code. That's it, yeah. So Judge Reinhardt struck down the injunction that Judge Caulfield put in place and it was, but at this time it was kind of too late because Accolade had given up a little bit. Mm. When they released their basketball game, Charles Barkley's Shut Up and Jam, Yeah, it was officially licensed by Sega. Oh, they they were, just gave up. Yeah. So this case is important because it's referenced in every video game trial involving reverse engineering since 1993. Yeah. Like this case made it so it's okay for you to take an Xbox 360 and say, I want to design games for this and take it apart and see how it works. Yeah. That's what this whole trial is about. Hmm. Which I thought was... It's pretty pretty intense. Yeah, that is because it could have gone the other way. The, like the the other way that this could have gone is uh, no, sorry. If you make a a console, you're the only one that can make games for it, and nobody else is allowed to make games for it. They always have to go through you. And while that's kind of the case nowadays, because the copy protection schemes are so advanced that it's actually the pretty DRM difficult. stuff or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty difficult to break. Like once you get past like Super Nintendo era, this kind of this issue sort of goes away. Um, but you know, it's it is important for uh, things like, uh, which I guess we'll talk about later, but like the Game Genie or these kinds of unlicensed uh, accessories that require you to reverse engineer or the, require the manufacturer of those accessories to reverse engineer something. Um, it's important that this this is what makes that legal, basically. Yeah, it's it's a very important case. So the next one involves Nintendo, and in 1988 there was a shortage of ROM chips that Nintendo used in cartridges. And since Nintendo controlled the entire distribution of cartridges to its licensees, this meant that only 25% of what was asked for could be produced. And no licensee had any way to get ROM chips except by going through Nintendo. Mm, so they had an iron grip. Yeah, so Nintendo claimed that this was fine and everything that got produced was sold, so there was no extra cartridges or anything sitting in inventory, which seems to be a pattern with Nintendo. They hate overstock. Yeah. What's their, 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 remember they have their uh, dudes from Atari working there oh, who yeah. have been so burned by overstock. having to bury <laughs> ET cartridges. It's still haunting them. Yeah. So some licensees accused Nintendo of artificially creating this shortage so that they'd have even more control over the console market. And Nakajima, the Tengen guy, was one of the people who said this, by the way, because he has a strong beef with Nintendo at yeah. this time. Nintendo saw a whole bunch of lawsuits during this time accusing them of various anti-competitive practices. And one of these cases eventually required Nintendo... I think most of them settled out of court. Yeah. But this one was interesting. It required Nintendo to send $5 off coupons to anybody who bought an NES between 19, June 1998... No, 1988 and December 1990. And they had to run magazine ads and everything saying that these coupons were out there. Yeah. And it was pennies for Nintendo. And plus, the Super Nintendo had already hit the market. So these $5 off coupons were only for old games. Yeah, they had to send these coupons out in like late 1991, like after the Super Nintendo was already out. Yeah, so it was essentially just them being like, hey, here's coupons to get rid of our old inventory. Yeah. Like It was just a way for Nintendo. Nintendo lost in quotes, but they had to just, they just made more money this way, getting rid of NES cartridges. Yeah. And perhaps because of this, Nintendo finally allowed licensees to make their own cartridges and to make games for other systems. So Nintendo just says it was a coincidence, but this is them using this lawsuit to their advantage in a yeah. way to sell more cartridges. I think they were pretty sick of being, because there were lots of different lawsuits that were basically saying Nintendo is anti-competitive, they're doing all these things. I think at this point they were like, look, you can't say we're anti-competitive if we allow you to make your own cartridges and we allow you to make games for other systems. Like, sorry, you guys can just go off and do what you want now. It's also a real slippery slope because half of that control is the reason they were so successful. Right. Because they had a quality control system in place to make good games. Yeah. If they didn't do this in the beginning, there might not be a Nintendo. Yeah. It was important in the beginning. I think at this point, the the industry had like sort of restarted itself and, and gotten back on its feet. And it, that, that wasn't... The, the reasons that Nintendo made those rules were not really things to worry about anymore and so they were much more okay with it i gotta say i would hate to work on the nintendo legal team from 1989 to 1994 because you were in trials all the time it seemed like yeah that's just, when it, all of these took place yeah uh we got another one yeah uh, with nintendo this one is between lewis galoob toys Do you remember the the 90s brand galoob galoob it's also a fun thing to say yeah lewis galoob toys versus nintendo this is about 
the Game Genie. Did you ever have a Game Genie? I had a friend that had an N64 Game Genie, and it was oh, yeah. so cool. Just yeah. all the cheats on GoldenEye, everything. Yeah, Game Genies were so cool. So if you don't know what a Game Genie is, a Game Genie was a device that you plugged your game cartridge into, and then you put the Game Genie into your uh, NES or your Super Nintendo. Um, and basically what it did was it, it made tiny modifications to a game's programming allowing things like infinite lives infinite ammo maybe level skips like dk mode dk mode like there's all kinds of stuff that uh that these would do basically what what it did was like by modifying like specific areas of the game cartridge and a lot of time if i recall it just made it so you didn't have to type the code in the buttons yourself it just like unlocked it for you it was just on a menu screen that would start before the game started you turn all the stuff on and then go in yeah yeah there's there there's a, a lot of different ways this worked the book says that the the codes were put in the games by the developers, but that's not actually how it worked. Yeah, and I also, I remember, I remember them saying in the book, too, for, like, Legend of Zelda, it was like, oh, okay, it just makes games, like, a little easier. Like, yeah. Link would be invincible, or shops would sell everything for zero rupees. Yeah. So it's, like, things like that. Yeah, yeah, it would, it basically, it was, it would let you cheat at games, pretty much. It's, yeah, it's make it a little easier. Did. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of different fun combinations, and it actually breathed a lot of life into older games that would have otherwise gone stale. If you can go back to uh, your regular Super Mario game and be invincible and just totally dominate your way to Bowser, oh, it's like it's, it's pretty fun if you're all, if you're bored with the game. I didn't you know? know it was for Super Nintendo. Yeah, I had one for Super Nintendo. Did was it for regular Nintendo too? Yeah. How did it work for regular Nintendo to get it in the port and everything? It stuck. It stuck out. It like oh. you couldn't close the flap. It just and you couldn't push the thing down for the NES. It just like. It just literally stuck all the way and out. The, the, the drawer thing was open. The yeah. Little, that's crazy. The cartridge was out. Yeah, it was It was pretty weird. I, I remember a friend had one, and we couldn't really figure out how to get it to work. I think it was missing some plastic piece that Could it needed. Could you just buy a Game Genie at like a KB Toys? Is that kind of yep. how it worked at the time? Yep. Gosh, I miss those toy stores. Now they're all going away. Yeah, I know. Um, Sorry to bum everybody out. That's all right. <laughs> Let's go back into this so, lawsuit. <laughs> anyway, Game Genie, super fun. Uh, made games fun, and you're cheating. Who cares? Nintendo. That's a good summary. <laughs> Nintendo didn't like this, mostly because Galoob didn't get a license to make this thing. Uh, classic. Nintendo wants control. Right? They didn't need to because the the lockout chips in the Super Nintendo and the regular Nintendo, they you, because you plugged your game cartridge into it, they just used the chip that was in the cartridge you plugged into it. It didn't matter. So yeah. they didn't even have to really work around it, right? In a way, Louis Galoob is a genius. Indeed. Um, actually, I bet... I bet that would have been a good way for Tengen to get around it, too, if they were just like, hey, you need to plug in your one legitimate Super Mario Brothers cartridge. And oh, yeah. It would, work. it would be so cool to be related to Louis Galoob, because, you know, Christmas that year, you were getting a Game Genie. Oh, yeah. It's pretty dope. For sure. Um, so, anyway, Nintendo didn't like it. Um, they they didn't like that they didn't have a license. I think they also didn't like it because it was modifying games in a way that Nintendo didn't really have control over. Because there's while there are a lot of really cool codes, if you just went in and typed random stuff in, chances are you were just going to like crash the game or make just stupid stuff happen. Like, yeah. <laughs> that was just not fun, right? Um, so Nintendo sued Louis Gloob. Um, they were able to stop the Game Genie from being manufactured while the case was in court. They filed an injunction. So they said, hey, this case is in court. You guys can't sell this while we hash this out, right? Um this was also judged by that same person who judged Atari games versus Nintendo. This guy is just everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but that judge's interpretation of fair use for that court case was really huge in this case. Um, so Nintendo claimed that the Game Genie uh, did not play original games. It copied the work of those games, making slight modifications, thereby infringing upon the copyright for those games. It was like, you're not making new games here. You're just taking games that already exist. And you're just changing them a little bit and you're, you're letting people play them. What are you doing? This is BS. Yeah, what are you doing? Um, they referenced an older case uh, about so-called speed-up kits that, and that we talked about, like our our homies General Computer used, right. used to make expansion kits, Favorite remember? company. Right. They used to make those expansion kits. So um, speed-up kits were things that were made for arcade machines. Um, there was a case uh, where Midway had sued Arctic International over a Galaxian speed-up kit, and Midway won, basically by saying... Uh, you didn't make this game. You just slightly modified our game, which is not cool. Which is weird because if the I think they could have in the book it says you should have referenced the case of General Computer, yeah, and Atari, Cause, right? Because General Computer was allowed to make their expansion kits. Right? Yeah, no, they lost. Oh, but they Atari settled, bought them. They they settled. Yeah, they right. didn't go to trial. They settled out of court, and then they ended up working for Atari. That's right. Yeah, and then Atari's like, oh yeah, you're making games for us. That's cool. Yeah. So the the judge didn't buy it though. The Game Genie had no copyrighted code in it. Um, and players still had to buy the games that they were modifying. So it wasn't like you weren't losing sales on video games because like, if you wanted to give Super Mario infinite lives, you still had to buy Super Mario. You still had to own that game. 
Um, so it didn't affect sales in any way. It like, it in fact, could be argued that it enhanced those sales. Yeah, people are like, oh, I can cheat on Legend of Zelda? I yeah. can beat it now. I'm going to go buy that game. Right. Um, so something interesting about this case uh, that the book says, um, it's unclear whether the if so if it were judged that this is copyright infringement this these codes are copyright infringement it's not clear whether galoob would be the one infringing on copyright or the consumers themselves i thought this was very very crazy because it, galoob doesn't like they just make the device the consumer is the one that puts the game of their choice in and types the code in themselves and actually makes the by, modification by using a product you could be like infringing on a copyright that's just that's just nuts yeah and so it's not glue they're just like we just make we just made the hammer like if you break into somebody's house with this hammer that's not our fault right some eight-year-old kid is charged with copyright infringement because he wanted to beat zelda yeah uh it didn't end up mattering because galoop won either way so if nintendo had won that case that would could have been real weird here's looking at you galoop that's right so what ha- ended up happening was Nintendo had to pay $15 million to Galoob in lost sales, remember, because they had to stop selling this while the court oh, case yeah. was ongoing. So because Nintendo lost, the judge was like, yo, you stopped them from selling this for however long we- this case went on for, you need to pay for that, right? Uh, so they had to pay Galoob for lost sales. Nintendo tried to push this to the Supreme Court. They wanted to go all the way. They were not okay with a Game Genie. But ultimately, they decided... Uh, the, the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. They were just like, you know what? Whatever that last judge said, we're going with that. I like to think Howard Lincoln in Redmond, Washington is just walking into a Toys R Us and he sees a game genie and he just goes, ugh, and yeah. he walks away. Every time he's like this. Every time. Bad. All the way through N64. <laughs> yep. Um, interestingly enough, uh, so they would never get a license to do this on Nintendo. The Sega version of the game genie for the Genesis was a fully licensed, like Sega used to advertise it. They loved it. They thought it was the coolest thing ever. And they know? like, it was fully licensed. Sega's pretty cool. Yeah. I, speaking of which, this is a small tangent on a long episode, so I'm going to make this very quick. <laughs> I've been trying to find my Sega Genesis. I think it was a three, now that I think about it, because I got it in 1992. Uh-huh. And my mom just doesn't know where it is. And Damn I think it. she gave it away, and she doesn't have the heart to tell me, because she's uh-huh. a nice lady. Yeah. But I just really want it again. I miss Sega Genesis. Yeah. Do you want to talk about this one, or you want me to do this one? Uh, you do this one, because I'll do the last one, the bonus case. Okay, so this one is involves Alpex Computer Corporation versus Nintendo. And do you all remember the Fairchild Channel F and how cool it was for being the first cartridge-based system? Yes, I do. That's right. Alpex Computer Corp. is the company that made that technology, and it licensed that technology to Fairchild. They patented cartridges. Wow. So what ended up happening is when all these companies started making cartridge games again they sued and they licensed it to magnavox atari mattel bally and coleco these were companies that were just like you know what that's fine you own this they're like hey we'll yeah we're you not gonna argue this here's some money but one of the large console manufacturers missing was nintendo like the classic nintendo the nes never paid for a license yeah. to alpex and this is like just typical of the company Nintendo, yeah, right? Yeah. Of course, they're not going to pay for this BS, yeah. right? Yeah. And Alpex filed for bankruptcy in 1983, and it's crazy because they had like that groundbreaking technology. Yeah, I think cartridges. it's so weird that they went out of business. Yeah, so after filing for bankruptcy, they realized the only way they're going to make money is if they try to say, hey, we got a patent for cartridges. And so they essentially like started winning cases and securing licenses with tons of different video game console manufacturers. But Nintendo claimed that while they did definitely use cartridge technology, Alpex's tech wasn't good enough for their system. It was just so old. It's pretty technical as to why, so I'll just leave it at that. But it was not advanced enough to handle... I think also the color scheme of Nintendo had way yeah. more data to move back they, and forth. They were basically like, your your cartridges don't hold enough, and they're not fast enough, and they're just not good enough to do the awesome advanced graphics that we do yeah. on the NES. In a way, they're like, hey, our system's just too cool for your technology. Right. So... They claim that their technology was far too advanced for the Alpex cartridge, and they invented their own similar one, but it was different because it was theirs. And the judge didn't buy it. He actually ordered Nintendo to pay Alpex $252 million. (laughs) It's one of the largest patent cases ever. So when Nintendo appealed it, though, it was overturned. And that judge was convinced that they were sufficiently different. The, The cartridges, yeah, this technology is way different and more advanced than this Alpex technology was. And Nintendo got away with it again. In a way, it kind of reminds me of patent trolls right now in podcasting. It's like that. Like, they had this patent for this thing a long time ago, and now that it's here, they're like, hey, wait, 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 wait. And it's like, it's in reality, it's very different because 
technology has changed. There are some companies that exist solely to sue other companies. They just hold patents and they sue other companies. That's oh, yeah. all they do. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, they were going after podcasting for the longest time. Yeah. And then I think, was it Adam... What's the guy from the? He has this. He was the carpenter. He has a show on the the Man Show. Adam Carolla. Adam Carolla. He was the one that went after it and was like, "I'm taking him to trial." Mm. So he was like fighting. Like, him, I'm not fighting gonna sell. Back. We're doing. And I this. think he did like a Patreon thing to get that going, so he could. When was that? I don't even. Know. This was uh, two years ago. Oh wow! Yeah, it was like a GoFundMe thing. It was actually advertised on all the big podcasts. Like I think Mark Marion because he actually pooled together all the podcasters. They had like a meeting of the biggest podcasters, like. We got to deal with this because these patent trolls are coming for our shows. Yeah. Like it would be like, oh, you're not going to pay us this fee to use our technology in very big quotes. Yeah, like, then we're going to shut your podcast down. Oh wow. Yes. Yeah, I, I did. You, I do remember there being some legal issues around this at some point after the uh, Twit Network started up this week. Oh in tech. yeah. Um, that's why they call their podcasts or they're all netcasts. That's oh, what they netcasts. Yeah. Anyway. I like internet radio shows. Yeah, I like that terminology. But yeah, so this case. It's about cartridges, and Al, I mean, it's kind of why other companies could use cartridges. It doesn't mention if Sega had to license to Alpex. It doesn't mention that in the book. I wonder if they had to. I'll look that up separately. Yeah, later. I bet Sega did. Like, it's, it, Sega seemed like a cool company that was just like, hey, thanks for this cool technology. Here's Here you some go. money. Here's some money. Also, give us all your game genies. Yeah. We got a fun hedgehog. He rolls. It's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love hedgehogs? Okay. All right. So, I want to talk about one more case. And this is all you. This, this is bonus case. Legal, not in the book. Legal analyst Tyler. I love this case because um, I'm a big fan of emulation. Um, and it's often uh, like, so, so f- emulation is basically being able to play the games of one system on another system that they were not made for. Usually a PC, usually right? a PC, but yeah, uh, it's basically making one machine act like another machine for the purpose of running the software of that other machine. It's just inherently cool. Right. It's super cool. Um, people often have questions about like, well, how is this legal? How is it legal for me to play Nintendo games on my PC? I don't have to buy a Nintendo to play these Nintendo games. What the heck? Right. I'll tell you why it's legal. It's because of a case between a company called Bleem, with an exclamation mark, Bleem. Like say like, Bleem. Yeah, Bleem and Sony. So emulation had existed before Bleem came around, but Bleem was a commercial company that made a commercial software product that they sold in stores that allowed consumers to play PlayStation games on their PC. This was in 1999, a little bit towards the end of the PlayStation's lifespan, before the PS2 had come out, but still firmly within the original PlayStation's lifespan. They also made a version for the Dreamcast in single game varieties, one for Metal Gear Solid, one for Tekken 3, and one for Grand Theft So you could buy a PC program that only plays Metal Gear Solid on your computer? Uh, no, the PC one played any PlayStation game. Oh, I mean for Dreamcast. Yeah, the Dreamcast, Dreamcast one Xbox. was like, you buy this disc from them, and um, then, then, you you buy... can, then you you also have to buy Metal Gear Solid for PlayStation, and you put the disc in your Dreamcast, you boot it up, and then the Dreamcast is like, hey, put your Metal Gear Solid disc in, and you put your Metal Gear Solid disc in. And you play, and that's Metal what's Gear really Solid. important about this, right? Owning the disc, right? Very important that you own the disc. So, Sony obviously was not happy with this. They thought that providing a way to play PlayStation games on PC was unfair competition. So they sued Bleem for making this thing. They were like, "This is BS. People can play our games without having to buy our system. That's stupid." Um, so this case has two very important outcomes. When Sony realized they couldn't win the case against the actual software. So the first outcome is reverse engineering a thing to make uh, to make your stuff work is okay, which we knew from earlier, right? Um, this solidifies that, once again, that it's okay to reverse engineer something. When they realized they weren't going to win that case, what they did was they, they threw a Hail Mary and they decided to sue based on the fact that Bleem was using screenshots of their games <laughs> on their marketing materials. And what Bleem would use the screenshots for was one of the things that was cool about Bleem on both Dreamcast and PC was like, it was like, you can play your PlayStation games on your PC. Also, they're going to look a little better. So they had some like before and after screenshots of like slightly oh, better Oh, you get some a little better high resolution. Right. So that's why they were, that's why they were using screenshots of PlayStation games in their marketing materials. Um, so yeah, they, they thought that was not cool. And they said they hoped to put a stop to sales of the product. So real that, Hail Mary. Yes. Right. <laughs> real Hail Mary didn't work. Sony lost on all counts, solidifying the legality of emulators in general that, uh, that didn't use copyrighted software, right? Um, that were fairly reverse engineered and the fair useness of using in-game screenshots for advertising, even if you don't own the game. That's in huge. Question. Yeah. So if you're making a product that makes your, that makes games look better, like, I mean, I can imagine PC manufacturers doing this all the time of like being like, Hey, here's a game you can play on our PC or even just like a graphics card company being like, this is what destiny two looks like on our graphics cards. Ooh, it looks great. Yeah. 
Um, so that was important. So even though, um, or even though Bleem won this case, um, the legal cost was too much for them. Like they, they just couldn't afford to like do this. Um, they had to close shop the same year that Sega closed shop on the Dreamcast. RIP. Mm-hmm. Um, so for this reason, we still haven't seen many or really if any uh, commercial emulator products produced by third parties. The problem is if you make an emulator and start to sell it, you open yourself up to these lawsuits, even if they're kind of BS lawsuits. Um, the, the, you don't want to be caught spending money to fight these lawsuits, basically. Um, and they would probably continue to happen because it is a little, it de- like I can see there being a case made, right, of like this is not cool. Yeah. So you will probably get sued if you do this. Open source emulators, free emulators, um, they continue to thrive right now. There are actually some really good open source emulators. Most most good emulators are open source um, and and free. So they they do really well because it's hard to sue like a group of people. That, yeah, a lot that, of the time you said it was like kickstarted. Yeah, or not even. Yeah, they're like kickstarted or Patreon. Like it's really hard to sue folks for that kind of stuff and when it's clear that they're not really they're not actually making money off of the emulator because the emulator is free there are patreons where it's like oh i will pay money to like help this person continue work on this emulator but you're not actually buying the emulator because the emulator is for like those ones on patreon and kickstarter like you have to own the game still. yes you do so. still have to own the games for it to be legal we do want to be clear when you emulate games on your computer you definitely still have to own the game for it to be legal so it's kind of cool now because you can pretty much get any old PlayStation or PS2 game online for super cheap yep. and then you can play it on your PC in an emulator. Right. Yep. So interestingly, um, pretty much every large video game manufacturer would eventually make emulators for themselves. The Wii Virtual Console, PlayStation Classics on PS3 and PS4, and all of how Microsoft's Xbox 360 and Xbox One backward compatibility work is the same way, is, is this technique of emulation. Um, they, they don't modify the games themselves. They just make the console able to run games made for something else can i just say something cool. real quick yeah thank you bleem yeah you're the best bleem. bleem you're the best yeah um so i someday i would love to do like a history of I emulation we, we will episode. do that yeah um so anyway that's the story of bleem and i think it's a pretty cool one so mike what have you been playing i and you tyler have gotten our shirts on destiny 2 yes we did it and also oh uh, hold on i gotta find my phone tyler talk about it Oh, man. So we got the 250 triumph points needed to order our T-shirts. We still have to pay for the T-shirts. They're not free T-shirts. Um, they also offer an option to put your uh, username on your T-shirt. And we Did bo- we both do that option? Yes. And are we going to wear our shirts at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we became legend this weekend and got our shirts. It's a very exciting time. I hope everybody is excited for us. I will say I want to give props again because I, I mentioned I, I got it and then... Uh, uh, our our one our favorite one of our favorite people in the entire world Elise on Twitter oh, she yeah. was curtain up on Big a fan. review she she gave us a th- good job and it made me feel nice so <laughs> thank you for saying that because yeah Elise. she's it's good to know someone's out there rooting for our shirts you yeah. know it makes yep. us feel good <laughs> but yeah we got those and now the best part about it is we can take a break yeah <laughs> I, I love Destiny but I kind of want to not play it oh, right now yeah and I actually ended up playing. All of the campaign of Star Wars Battlefront 2 after we did it, because I was like, I just want to beat this campaign, and I got some gripes. Yeah. It's a good campaign. It's fun. I was invested in it. They just really lead you on in the campaign. Because, yeah, there's a moment, spoiler alert, where you play as Han Solo, and you get information on how to free the Wookiees on Kashyyyk, okay? And then you just go a different direction and he goes out and does that and you don't get to play as him and I'm oh. like I want to liberate the Wookiees dang it I've wanted to do that in the video game forever why just let me go do that so it does stuff like that where it leads you on and then the campaign was left really open ended I just hope they close it out if they close it out I'm going to be happy if they leave it open ended like that I'm going to be super bummed oh, yeah because they've been releasing DLC like free DLC that ke- keeps the campaign going yeah huh? they've done two so far and the, there was one campaign DLC and then there was the most recent DLC which was all the stuff on Naboo with like the battle droids and the mm-hmm. trade federation mm-hmm. from episodes one two and three those don't have any campaign DLC oh which is kind of a bummer because I really I wanted to play more of it. It's just like it's very open ended ending, which I guess is good because you know Star Wars Battlefront three. Mm-hmm. But I just I don't I didn't feel closure at the end of it, and That's I want to feel closure. But mm-hmm. I had fun playing it, and I also tried a game called Volgar the Viking that is so hard. <laughs> it's like because we've been talking about these old platformer games, so I decided to play an indie game that was emulating that. Oh man, just 
unforgiving. Just you, you, the way the health works is you can get hit as many times as armor pieces you have, but when you get hit, you lose those armor pieces, and those make you way stronger. So it's oh, like you get no. weaker and weaker each time. It's Ooh. punishing, but it was really fun. What have you been playing? Uh, well, got got my shirt. So happy about that. Proud of you. Battle for Azeroth is out now, so I'm about to uh, begrudgingly start a new character, boost it to level 110. I don't like character boosts. But I'm going to do it because I want to play with my friends. And they're, we're going to play on Horde, too, which I'm usually an Alliance person. So you I'm really, really holding my nose when I play WoW with my friends. You're going to be a bad guy. I'm gonna, well, Horde aren't necessarily bad guys. They're just the morally ambiguous guys. Um, I mean, whatever you got to do to justify it to yourself, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> um yeah, so I haven't done it yet, but I definitely paid for the expansion yesterday, and I'm probably gonna roll a Pandaren uh, hunter because I, I look really at like Panda Hunter. Arrows. Yeah, it's a Panda hunter, so that's gonna be pretty fun. Um, I also started up Final Fantasy XII, the uh, Zodiac Age uh, remake that came out on Steam a little while back. Um, so I'm about five or six hours into that, and that game is really fun. It's very satisfying. It has a system called a Gambit system, which basically lets you. Um, cause the combat is sort of real time. Um, it lets you program the other people in your party cause you don't have direct control over the p- other people in your party. Um, it lets you program them with what you want them to do. So like if you have a healer in your party and you want them to heal you, you'd be like, Oh, if party leader is below 50% health, heal that party member. Right? So as the game progresses, you get more and more complex with how you can do these things. And so the real fun and people cite this as like a reason they don't like this game is cause the game basically plays itself. But the real fun is when you have a gambit system that's so good that you can just walk through areas and everything dies and you don't have to do anything. That's really cool. It's like, I think it's satisfying in a way because like you program them to do that. Like you made it that way so they could do that, which I think is really cool. So, oh yeah. Yeah. So that's been fun. That's really all I've been playing. Um, but mostly just those two things. I also have been watching, this is relevant to this podcast. I have been watching a show called Halt and Catch Fire, mm-hmm. which is uh, an AMC show about, it's a drama about a uh, fictional computer startup in the 1980s. Um, they go, they make like a computer. I've heard of and this they show. Make a, it's really good. And I'm on the third season now. And I just, I had forgot about it because I watched the first two seasons and then forgot about it. And now I'm back on the third season. And it's all on Netflix. So, ooh, that was my easy, next question. Easy to binge. Man, it's so good. I love it. And it has the guy uh, from Pushing Daisies, Lee Pace, who plays Ronan the Accuser in. Guardians oh, of the Galaxy. Yeah. He's like a sort of Steve Jobs kind of like, but probably a little bit more psychopathic than even Steve Jobs <laughs> or sociopathic than Steve Jobs. Um, so there's like a lot of like early Apple parallels with the, there's like a Steve Wozniak character who's not quite like Steve Wozniak, but like sort of. And then there's Lee Pace's character who's like, like Steve Jobs, but not quite the same. Like he's different, but similar, you know? Um, it's really cool and it's like historical so it's like take place in the 80s so there's like all this like 80s stuff that's going on there it's a great show recommendation we should do that more often for fun yeah I highly recommend it Halt and Catch Fire good yeah that's good well thank you so much for listening sorry this was a long episode we just wanted to get everything in you know we wanted to be like this is our legal episode right and I mean, mad props again to Tyler for throwing in that emulation one that wasn't in the book. Because yeah. we'll we got to go in the future, which is good. That's right. I love that one. I and love I, the Bleem case. It's one of my favorites. So. It's, it was very good and very informative. And don't forget, you can follow Tyler on Twitter at SneakerElf, E-L-P-H. You can follow me at Me Coletta, M-E-C-O-L-E-T-T-A. I do know how to spell my own name. Also, you can email us at CodexHistoryPodcast at gmail.com. You could leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. That would help a lot. Or just tell your friends. I also want to give a mad shout-out to Josh Mustachio. <laughs> On Twitter, he uh, tweeted at me that he liked the show and he listened to it and it meant the world to me. Thank you so much, Josh. And I hope that's not your real last name. It's a nickname. I don't want to give people's full names. I feel weird about it. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, but I, I mean, if it is your last name, no problem. But that's I think a cool last it name. is a really cool last name if it's your last name. But thank you so much, Josh, for tweeting at us. Thank you again for tweeting at us, Elise. It means the world to us. Mm-hmm. And with that, thank you so much. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week. This has been a Potaholics Comedy Network presentation. Potaholics.com